Paris would not be Paris without its emblematic monuments, its large avenues, and its sublime caves on the Seine. What we're not necessarily aware of is that Paris owes these to Emperor Napoleon I, who reigned from 1799 to 1815. He wanted to make Paris an international capital, modern, with monumental buildings. If it weren't for him, there'd be no Arc de Triomphe, a giant 164 feet tall building with colossal foundations. It took 30 years to build. Now the Arc de Triomphe, when it's completed, will be shock and awe for anyone who comes to Paris. This is the monument of the Grand Armée and what it did to its enemies. The emperor created the Madeleine, a 355 feet long temple of antique architecture, whose area equals that of Paris Notre Dame and hides an exceptional device. Without this metal frame, without this system of armored stone, the whole colonnade would collapse in the street. Testimony to the civil engineering of Bonaparte, the first big Parisian main street half a mile long was created from scratch, Rue de Rivoli. What really distinguishes Rue de Rivoli is its width, its height, and its rectilinear layout. The magnificence of this monumental street brings air and life to Paris. Under his reign, Paris will become a capital worthy of antique Rome, as shown by the 145 feet Vendôme column. What's needed are monuments that proclaim the power of his regime and army. Bonaparte was also a pioneer in sourcing drinking water in Paris, thanks to the Ourc Canal, which is more than 62 miles long. You are going to come into this city and you are going to see brand spanking modernity that you don't have. You're also going to see power, and it emanates from me. Unique architecture, the latest technology, whilst in the background, deadly wars are being fought. This is the story of Napoleon I's Paris. Eighteen sixteen, Saint Helena Island. Exiled in the middle of the Atlantic, Napoleon I has laid down his arms. However, he's not just thinking about his stinging defeat. He's thinking of Paris. It's my constant dream to make it the true capital of Europe. Something fabulous, colossal, never seen before. Napoleon didn't have time to realize his imperial capital, but he laid the groundwork. The history of the emperor and Paris begins in a city of which very few traces remain a medieval city with narrow, dark streets. A real shambles. You have to imagine Paris at the end of the 18th century as a Paris which is pitch black at night, a Paris which is still dangerous. All the work of Napoleon and his successors, and rightly so, will consist of opening up Paris, bringing fresh air, and installing monuments. If one place incarnates the ambition of Napoleon as regards Paris, it's the Place de l'Étoile, the birthplace of the Arc de Triomphe. The Arc de Triomphe has absolutely extraordinary dimensions. 164 feet height, 147 feet wide, and 72 feet deep, so it's absolutely insane. All around the Arc de Triomphe, the major axes, the Avenue de la Grande Armée, the Avenue de Wagram, the Avenue de Friedland. They proclaim the military victories of the empire, and it is not by accident. This colossal monument owes everything to a major event, 
a turning point in the history of France and of Napoleon's, the Battle of Austerlitz. In 1805, France is a country at odds with Europe. It is ruled by a military man who has fought nearly 10 years for the French Revolution. He had several victories before becoming first consul in 1799, then emperor in 1804. At the time, France reigns over a significant territory which extends from Belgium to the north of Italy. To strengthen his power in Europe, Napoleon prepares to invade Great Britain. At the camp at Boulogne-sur-Mer, he assembles his great army, 190,000 men. It's all set up, ready to go. They've been training for three years now, so they're very, very good. These guys, and he reckons that once you get to the south of England, it's an easy job to get to London. No one will stop me. There's no army. Aware of the danger, the British form an alliance with Russia and Austria to defeat the great army. So Napoleon brutally changes his strategy. On the 2nd of December, 1805, he gains a crushing victory at Austerlitz, which is part of what is now the Czech Republic, exactly one year to the day of his coronation. Austerlitz was a vindication of the years, literally years, of hard training when he took raw conscripts, boys straight from the farms, and turned them into the greatest military machine Europe had ever seen, a weapon of mass destruction. They were going to come back to Paris to his capital as heroes, and they were going to show both Paris and the whole of France what this new regime was made of. To celebrate this victory, which alone symbolizes the power of his empire, the emperor decrees in the month of February 1806 the construction of two Arcs de Triomphe, or triumphal arches, one of which will be on L'Etoile. These triumphal arches initiated by Rome have remained through the ages the architecture of a victorious army. The first arch, called the Carousel, is relatively modest with a height of 62 feet, a width of 75 feet, a depth of 23 feet, and equipped with three arcades. It will be built in front of the imperial residence of the Tuileries Palace, within the confines of the Louvre. It's a great success on the part of Napoleon and his architects, who were Percier and Fontaine. They succeeded in creating on a site opposite the Tuileries, which no longer exists and which was Napoleon's palace, an Arc de Triomphe based on the human scale, perfectly successful in its architecture, perfectly balanced. But for the second one, Napoleon pictures a magisterial arch, worthy of the tremendous victory at Austerlitz. It's the most imposing monument that he will leave for posterity. A reminder for centuries to come of the feat of arms of his great army. An arch which the emperor pictures in the east of Paris on Place de la Bastille on the site of the ancient fortress, symbol of the ancient regime, which fell on the 14th of July, 1789. This project strongly displeased Champagny, who was the Minister of the Interior at the time, who was in charge of the large-scale public works, because he knew that such an enormous arch in a fairly closed-off area was not going to have perspective, and that was not the aim. Before deciding where to place the monumental arch, a commission is gathered. On the suggestion of the future architect of the monument, Jean-Francois Chalgrin, the commission will recommend to Napoleon to build the arch not in the east of the capital, but to the west entrance of the city, still hardly built up, at the top of a hill, Place de l'Etoile. 
Napoleon comes to realize that not only is he going to get Paris to see the instrument of valorization of his conquests, but he's also going to showcase it outside Paris, so basically to the rest of the world. By building it there, Napoleon is completing that, what you might call, line that was traced by a hand of genius under Louis XIV, that runs from the Louvre to Tuileries, through the gardens, up the Champs of the Isée to the top of the hill. There is now something at the top of the hill that completes that panorama. Napoleon will be able to admire this arch from his residence at the Tuileries Palace. In order for it to be seen, it must, therefore, have colossal dimensions. Whereas the biggest Arc de Triomphe of ancient Rome is 82 feet high, the Arc de Triomphe de l'Etoile will be twice as big and will reach a height of 164 feet. At that time, to construct a building out of scale is perfectly consistent and appropriate with the political discourse that Napoleon wants to keep, which is to assert his power on the whole world. Now, the Arc de Triomphe, when it's completed, will be shock and awe for anyone who comes to Paris, particularly a foreigner. This is what I did. Don't you dare try anything again. The first stone of this exceptional monument will be placed as early as May 1806. However, its definitive form is not yet finished. Only its gigantic dimensions of 164 feet high, 147 feet wide, and 73 feet deep, and its tetrapylon character, with its four arcades oriented east to west and north to south, have been agreed upon. With such dimensions, the structure will come close to 100,000 tons. 100,000 tons of material, of which half will be invisible, buried 26 feet under the ground. The foundations are colossal in terms of dimensions and weight. So for the most structural parts of the foundation work, that is to say, most angles and some edges, an enormous stone will be used. However, filling the entire foundation is sometimes done with more heterogeneous materials, whose role is primarily to add some weight, to properly secure the foundations to the ground. The construction of this exceptional monument will be entrusted to one of the best architects in Paris, the architect who had the idea of locating the arch at the top of the Champs-Élysées, Jean-François Chalgrin. In order to increase the shock effect and admiration caused by the monument, he will give it simple forms with clear lines to portray its volume as comprehensible as possible. It's got to be simple. There's no need to be ornate. That smacks of the past. A simple, straight, direct statement. That was the Roman way, that was the Greek way. There's no need for fancy decor as regards this big space. Its size says it all. But very quickly, the size of the Arc de Triomphe poses a problem for the architect. The colossal archway will reach 82 feet high and must support the weight of the structure. A problem emerges. It will exert strong pressure towards the ground. So how to contain it? The architect has a bright idea. Its feet will be massive. We need the maximum weight possible in the structure, where this oblique appears, to pull down the force, right down to the foundations. We need a massive structure which is completely overloaded with building material. In the upper part of the structure, Chalgrin will create space with the use of rooms. Chalgrin knows that this monument will be built to last, so the choice of materials is crucial. 
That's why he decides to build it out of dimension stone, and not just any stone, white stone called Chateau Landon stone. It's a stone whose great virtue is that it's very tough. The material must really be able to withstand very high compression rates. And finally, I think the choice of the stone is linked to the notion of facing masonry. That's to say, the finishing that Chagrin wished to implement. If the works on the Arc de Triomphe start in 1806, and his solid plans are never contradicted, Napoleon is unaware that he will never see its completion. Due to political reasons, this work, which will go through thousands of workers, will last 30 years. Intoxicated by the Austerlitz victory, the emperor orders another monument in parallel to the construction of the Arc. A huge column which dominates the heart of the capital from the center of Place Vendôme. Inspired by the Emperor Trajan column in Rome, the Vendôme column is over 140 feet with a diameter of 10 feet. Its 787 feet long decoration celebrates the epic that was this victorious campaign. It's made with bronze from cannons captured from the Austrians and the Russians. At its summit, Napoleon places a statue where he is represented in the guise of a Roman emperor. It is one of the rare statues of him which survives today in the capital. Napoleon knows that to be immortal, he must create prestigious monuments. Monuments which, to some extent, vaunt the power of his regime and army. To build this monument, erected on the location of an old statue of King Louis XIV and destroyed during the Revolution, the workers start by checking the foundations. At a depth of 98 feet, they are considered fit to accommodate this monument. The column itself is made from dimension stone. Its bronze decor divided into 425 plaques is fixed to the stone with clamps. Initiated in 1806, the works will be completed with the help of enormous scaffolding. It will take four years. During this time, the tension between European powers will allow Napoleon to amass new military victories. Victories which will allow the erection of new monuments to his glory and to that of his great army. During the year of 1806, Prussia declares war on Napoleon. A flash campaign follows, during which the emperor crushes the Prussian army, the most reputed in Europe, in Jena on the 14th of October. Less than a year after Austerlitz, who would have believed such a victory? It was something quite incredible. And it was necessary to mark that in the urban Parisian landscape, by something which made a link between this worship of antiquity, this worship of the Roman army, with a modern worship for a modern army, which was the great army. It's a new antique-inspired monument with crazy dimensions that Napoleon decides to erect. A temple dedicated to the glory of the army, which would become the Madeleine Church. The monument, built in the pure Greco-Roman style, occupies the same superficial measure as the nave of Notre Dame Cathedral. 354 feet long, 141 feet wide, 98 feet high. With its pediment, its portico, and its 52 Corinthian columns, this monument will contribute in turn to make Paris the imperial capital which Napoleon dreams of. The only paradigm is Rome. We live through something that is absolutely unique. Nobody has ever done what we've done. We can't explain ourselves to our sons, we can't explain ourselves to our parents. The only reference we have to the rest of history is ancient Rome. In 1807, a competition is organized. Among the candidates, the architect Pierre-Alexandre Vignon, 43 years old.
The Temple of Glory could be the chance of a lifetime. He will work non-stop to deliver a pure project, monumental, a perfect imitation of a Greco-Roman temple. Although Pierre-Alexandre Vignon only wins second place in the competition, it is, however, his project that the emperor will set his sights on. It had to be something that did not detract from the purpose, and that was to class these people with classical heroes. That was to bracket them with the bravest soldiers of Greece and Rome in the same way, but not to overshadow it and overawe it with anything inconsequential. The antique temple, designed by Vignon, will consist of an imposing stylobate of 27 steps. At the center, a cella represents the heart of the building. Surrounded by a portico of 52 columns, it will be fitted with three cupolas. These cupolas will be equipped with oculi, which will allow the light to penetrate the building deprived of windows. A device directly inspired by one of the oldest Roman monuments still intact, the Pantheon. In the Madeleine, the only way to illuminate is effectively by zenithal lighting. The technique of the time permits this, as there's iron, there's glass, all these new products which effectively permit illumination by zenithal very easily. And as the temple is long, we will create three cupolas, but without a dome. But the three cupolas, turned towards the sky, are ultimately three times that of the Pantheon. This zenithal lighting, thanks to the three cupolas, allow to better understand the function that Napoleon wanted to give to this monumental building. More than just a temple dedicated to the glory of the army, the future Madeleine Church would have been, above all, a mausoleum to the glory of the soldiers of the empire fallen on the field of honor. The French army, the French soldiers, my men, have given their lives. These men have died and given their blood to protect it. It's not so much about my glory. It's about our sacrifice. Something permanent has to be done for these guys. But where to construct this temple of glory? Napoleon finds the solution in the area west of the capital. It's here that since the middle of the 18th century, a new monumental church is supposed to be built. A number of works had already been started, but the French Revolution put an end to it. This abandoned building site offers an ideal location for the temple, in alignment with the Place de la Concorde. In front of which, Napoleon orders the construction of a new facade to the building, which will mirror the other side of the square, the Palais Bourbon. This palace, in fact, presented an anomaly. It was angled in relation to the quays, so it wasn't didn't present its facade opposite the Madeleine Church. And for an era passionate about classicism, architecture perfectly positioned, the symmetry didn't work. Thanks to these two antique temples whose colonnades mirror each other, the Place de la Concorde stands out as the pivot, the patella of Napoleon I's imperial Paris. So here we are between two Greco-Roman-inspired monuments that Napoleon wanted. He placed one at the end of the Concorde Bridge, built under the Ancien Régime, with Rue Royale in its axis. But these two monuments, this tension which they induce, also correspond to another great monument, the Arc de Triomphe. So we have these great monuments which are going to make a monumental impression on this space. Therefore, the future Madeleine Church will impose itself as one of the main connections to Napoleon's monumental Paris. However, behind its apparent simplicity, it will create a problem to its architect. Firstly, where to find the ideal stone. 
It's imperative to know that an antique temple is made of elements of great importance. That is, marble stone. In Athens, marble allows the crossing of spaces like that, with a single stone, like a beam. However, the architect didn't have access to Athens' marble. He must make do with limestone from the Paris basin. Paris stone is a very different stone which doesn't allow for the monumentality of massive marble stones. Here we have 10 feet and the columns are around six and a half feet in diameter. So to get over 10 feet, it's impossible to do it with one single stone from the Paris basin. Consequently, how to hold up the edifice? The challenge is to assure the maintenance of the elements constituting the portico of the temple, an area which connects the central cella to the colonnade of the monument, separated by 10 feet of empty space. Vignon finds the solution in the attic of the edifice, a vaulted and empty space just above the portico. It's this space that the architect will equip with a metal frame of surprising modernity. This process is already known, but Vignon will perfect and develop it here on a colossal scale on this magnificent building. So under my feet, if we had a scanner, we would see the presence of iron. Invisible to the naked eye, it is this armature which will assure the support of the building. This metal spider's web is incorporated in the entire surface of the ceiling. However, to be effective, it must be stretched at its extremities by other thrusts. This will be the role of the vaults that will support them, assuring the maintenance of the ceiling above the portico. Without this metal frame, without this system of armored stone, well, the whole colonnade would collapse in the street. Another challenge, what material to use for the roof structure of the building? In the previous century, it's wood that would naturally have been chosen. However, at the beginning of the 19th century, passionate about modernity, Vignon will choose iron, a material more resistant to fires and parasites. Thanks to the progress of the iron and steel industry, these elements developed in a foundry were then assembled on site. The system is perfectly balanced. It's a draft blueprint placed on the structure in stone that itself has its thrusts, also managed by the hidden iron. It's a very political program inhabited by modernity and the leap forward that Napoleon wants to propel on the French society in all domains, including the domain of arts and science, since that's also his signature. The building work starts in 1808 and is finished in 1842. What Napoleon does not know is that some years later the monument will change function. Following the disastrous campaign in Russia in 1812, the Temple of Glory will finally become the Madeleine Church on his impulsion. For Napoleon to make Paris the capital of Europe, he cannot just build imposing monuments. Throughout his reign, he never stopped setting up numerous works in the capital to make it a practical city, well spaced in the image of its great rival, London. He built a number of infrastructures, markets, cemeteries like Père Lachaise, and even slaughterhouses. It is also Napoleon who will build the quays along the Seine, riverbanks that until then had offered a site worthy of the Middle Ages.
It's really about modernizing the city, to make the city flow with movement, both on the river, but also by creating one of the largest streets. And finally, it's an entire system with the creation of markets, the enlarging of the streets, etc. It's a system of global modernization. And that starts as soon as he rises to power, before he becomes emperor. In 1799, when he becomes, by coup d'etat, the first consul of the French Republic. Amongst the works of the consulate, one of them will drastically change the physiognomy of the capital forever, Rue de Rivoli. It stretches half a mile from the Louvre until the Place de la Concorde. What really distinguishes Rue de Rivoli is its width, its size, and its rectilinear layout. The magnificence of this monumental street, which has been compared to a powerful ventilator, which brings with it air and life into Paris. It's a very revolutionary street for the time, with its arcades to protect the pedestrian, its shops, inspired a bit by the Italians. Remember that Bonaparte did a campaign in Italy before becoming Napoleon. It's not there by chance. It's in the heart of the capital, in the Tuileries Palace, where King Louis XVI was overthrown in 1792, that the first consul is living. No longer here today, it was adjoined to the Louvre in an area which showed a totally different face. The area is principally made up of a maze of narrow winding streets. On the Tuileries side, there are especially large plots of nationalized buildings. So there are convents, the Foyon, the Assomption, the Capucine, and there are also mansions. On the Louvre side, the urban fabric is denser, so we have especially old buildings everywhere, representative of old Paris. Incidentally, Balzac will describe this area as an ocean of cobblestones. This area especially witnessed a bloody event which marked Bonaparte, then a general of the revolution. It's the royalist insurrection of October 9, 1795, the 13th Vendemiaire of year four, according to the revolutionary calendar in use at the time. A day which will drastically change the destiny of the young general Bonaparte on Rue Saint-Honoré at the foot of the Church of Saint-Roch. Very well armed, very well organized, bourgeois militias from the western suburbs of Paris organized a rising specifically to overthrow the government. That is the moment when he is summoned from obscurity to put them down. Actually, we can still see a few marks today. The impact of the bullets fired on the crowd by Bonaparte's forces who were posted at the end of the streets, which led to the Convention. So these are the traces of this bloody event. The event of Vendemiaire made Bonaparte a hero of the revolution. However, he remained the sworn enemy of the royalists. The Quartier around Rivoli, it's part of those right-wing, bourgeois suburbs that he crushed in Vendemiaire. He's going in there to destroy what he saw as a nest of dangerous right-wing royalism, which, of course, is right across the street from his office in the Tuileries, right across from where he sleeps. By destroying the area around the Tuileries to create Rue de Rivoli, Bonaparte, now first consul, will kill two birds with one stone. To impose his power to the area west of the city, populated by royalists, but also to materialize with stone the ambition of his new regime. Napoleon will entrust these works to Charles Bercier and Pierre Fontaine two men who will impose themselves as official architects of the regime. So Percy and Fontaine are an absolutely fabulous architectural duo. They will work together all their lives. They'd gone to Italy together to finish their studies. 
Napoleon will get to know them. But it will be a kind of intellectual and artistic thunderbolt. It will fall to Percier and Fontaine to outline the future Rue de Rivoli. It will stretch from Place de la Concorde, in the extreme west of the capital, up to the Louvre for half a mile. In order to serve this new axis, several main streets will be opened, such as Rue de Castiglion and Rue des Pyramides, two Napoleonic victories in Italy and Egypt. Napoleon still wants to put his stamp on the capital and to always give reminders of the army, of his campaigns and of his own reign. The opening of this huge street will cause the destruction of a number of buildings, Amongst them, an important place in the French Revolution, the Salle du Manège, seat of the Revolutionary Assemblies. It's within these walls on the 15th of January, 1793, that King Louis XVI was condemned to death by the deputies of the nation. We assume that Napoleon wasn't indifferent to the idea, firstly to start from scratch with these buildings, which are also representative of the ancient regime and the revolution, to really put his stamp on and mark the new regime of the consulate and later of the empire. Napoleon would like to turn Rue de Rivoli into a main highway which would cross Paris from east to west. he takes over a project which dates back to the revolution. According to this plan, Rue de Rivoli would follow the Louvre. It would then be extended by a large street which would join with Place de la Bastille to the east of the city. However, the obstacles are numerous. It's not going to happen. On the one hand, for practical reasons, also, for financial reasons, it needs something much more feasible, which is Rue de Rivoli. Unlike the rest of the city, Percier and Fontaine know they'll meet fewer obstacles around the Tuileries. Many religious buildings have been emptied of their occupants during the French Revolution. Mercier and Fontaine will replace this old neighborhood with innovative buildings with simple and harmonious lines. Facing the 65 feet wide street are buildings up to 98 feet tall, which must meet the same standard. Three floors, topped with a roof of which the size could vary, but the slope had to be 45 degrees. The interesting point about Rue de Rivoli is that it also forms an encasing for the Tuileries Palace. And the Tuileries Palace is a building, a castle which is very decorated, very ornate, and that's why he wants something very sober opposite, so that his residence stands out. But if Rue de Rivoli will become an emblem, it's also thanks to its numerous arcades opening onto the pavement. There are porticos intended to offer a covered passage to the strollers and which embody the personal stamp of Napoleon Bonaparte on this major thoroughfare. You can see there his Italian background because Corsicans from the cities, from the towns like Bassi and Ajaccio, they were Italians by culture. His father was educated in, in, in Pisa and, and at Rome and that comes over to him and it's his own style. It's that blend of French classicism and traditional Italian urbanism that is Napoli. The result is a unique street in the history of Paris so far. Harmonious and orderly, it will be the facade of the new regime, efficient, modern, like the great antique models which fascinate Napoleon Bonaparte and all his generation. That is the style of the educated, enlightened 18th century. They were about something new, and that newness was neoclassicism. If you look back, you look back to ancient Rome and to Greece. You do not look back to anything between yourselves and that. Napoleon has not yet become emperor when the works on this monumental street start in 1804. 
Once the street is opened, Bonaparte orders the building of sewers, the symbol of hygiene and modernity. At the same time, the first gantries are raised by the government before private investors take over to finish the buildings. More than just a simple street, it's a wealthy and commercial neighborhood that Napoleon Bonaparte wants to raise, a project completed during the 1820s. Vast and airy, House Menian before its time, Rue de Rivoli is also a testimony to the will of Napoleon to improve the quality of life for Parisians. Parisians that the first consul loves as much as he fears. Napoleon knows what the people of Paris are capable of. He was witness during the revolution. On the 10th of August, 1792, he attends the overthrowing of King Louis XVI and the massacre of the Swiss guards by the sans-culottes in the Tuileries Palace. He's present on that day and he sees the mob um, in action and he's disgusted by it. He's a nobleman and uh, he looks naturally down on, in French they call it la canaille, the mob, and that moment marks him psychologically this riot, terrible lawlessness. Napoleon knows that a population that is hungry, a population that is scared, can be extremely dangerous. That he is fully aware of, and also that a revolution in France begins in Paris. In order to be assured of the support of the Parisians, the First Consul begins to improve the quality of their lives. Because following the revolution, Paris is a dirty city, foul-smelling, where hygiene is not yet a notion. Paris is a city which is really lacking in drinking water. So people drink water from the Seine, which vaccinates you quite naturally if you survive it, but which is, let's say, extremely polluted. At the same time, London is supplied with water which was of a much higher quality than Paris. So there was a political stake vis-à-vis -vis the big capitals of the world, and Paris couldn't fall short. To remedy this deleterious situation, in 1801, the First Consul takes over a project several centuries old that nobody has ever succeeded in implementing. This primordial infrastructure, which the capital desperately needs, is the Canal de l'Ourcq, a network of 67 miles destined to provide Paris with drinking water. Napoleon was deeply influenced by Roman history. They, they all were. Those are the only books they had, and they read them. And if, say, you look at Rome, what did the great emperors do? They build canals, viaducts, to bring fresh water in to the people of Rome. It's to help the sans culotte. It's to bring them clean water. This canal, wanted by Bonaparte, will divert the water from the river Ourcq situated almost 62 miles northeast of Paris, before retrieving the water from several other streams, like that of the Beuvron and the Terroine. These waters will lead to the northeast of the city, to a gigantic basin at La Villette, from where the capital will be watered. The first consul will entrust the execution of this infrastructure, which is as important as it is political, to a man in which he has much confidence, the engineer Pierre-Simon Girard. Napoleon chose Pierre-Simon Girard because he knows him, because he fought the campaign in Egypt, and he has confidence, generally absolute confidence, in people who've been around him. And he will name him head of this big project, and whom will also benefit from all the technical contribution from the Department of Civil Engineering. It's really going to be the big project of this company of engineers. It's Pierre-Simon Girard who has the task of determining the course, the length, and who will manage the excavation. He will be reporting directly to the First Consul, who is very interested in this project. 
Napoleon, Napoleon will have a big dilemma. Will he build an aqueduct to transport the water solely for consumption, or will it be a canal? The canal has a double function, supplying Paris with drinking water, but also allowing for navigation. Spurred on by the First Consul, and against the wishes of numerous members of the Commission leading the study, the project will change in nature. More than just an aqueduct intended for bringing drinking water to the people of Paris, the Orc will need to prevail as a central element in the development of the economy of the city, an infrastructure which must bring quality spring water but also prosperity to the Parisians. With this canal, Napoleon can think about commercial development for the city. He fully understood that Paris and France were behind, yet again, on the big, big enemy, which was London. What you need to be aware of is that the English Industrial Revolution, as it starts in the last decades of the 18th century, is not a revolution in which the principal means of transport is the railways, but is in fact the canal. So they thought, what about using Canal de Locke to also bring provisions to Paris? So they're trying to kill two birds with one stone. In the month of May 1802, Napoleon Bonaparte signs the decree which will formalize the excavation of the Canal de Lourdes. In order to give full meaning to the double function of this canal, the First Consul will ratify the proposition of the engineers to add two additional waterways. South of the basin of La Villette, Canal Saint-Martin will cross the city and will be the junction with the Seine upstream from Paris. To the west, this role will be assigned to the Canal Saint-Denis, who in its turn will join the river, this time downstream of the capital. In this way, the boats will be able to cross Paris without having to follow the Seine. At those times, crossing Paris is dangerous. There are no locks, so it's a river. There are periods of low water and high water, and by going through Canal Saint-Martin, the basin of La Villette and Canal Saint-Denis, you can avoid all the twists and turns of the Seine. In order to establish a network designed to allow navigation while supplying Paris with drinking water, the engineer Pierre-Simon Girard has to respect one imperative to prevent the water from stagnating and thus losing its qualities. If you transport drinking water, you need the minimum amount of obstacles. That's why over 67 miles, there are only 10 locks. That's the minimum number of obstacles which could have hindered the flow of water. But Pierre-Simon Girard has another crucial problem to solve. With only 30 feet height difference, the equivalent of a three-story building. Between the highest point and the lowest point of the canal, its layout will have to be extremely precise. It's always challenging to make a canal go up and down. If you go up, you need to find more water, etc. So in fact, the easiest way is to use the canals parallel to the rivers. It's the easiest because if you need it, there's a natural current. Pierre-Simon Girard designs for his canal a course which follows the natural riverbeds, like the Ourc or the Marne. The Canal de l'Ourc will, therefore, be very long. It will total 67 miles between the intake of water at the river Ourc and its arrival in Paris. Under the leadership of the First Consul, Napoleon Bonaparte and the engineer Pierre-Simon Girard, the excavation work and the earthwork start as early as 1802. The laborers begin their work not from upstream to downstream, but from downstream to upstream, in order to evacuate the water from the rivers stopped by the digging of the canal. The Beuvron and the Terroir are going to flow into the Canal de Lourc, so this water, when it arrives, must be evacuated. So it will be evacuated by the Canal Saint-Denis. A canal is a big trench, slightly complicated because straight away you have locks which must be made with masonry. It's also complicated because you need to put clay in the bottom not to lose water, and at the time there wasn't concrete or material like that. So to make it watertight, rural techniques were still being used. Started in 1802, when Bonaparte is first consul, the Canal de Lourdes project will continue until 1822. Unexpected events are numerous. 
In addition to hundreds of thousands of tons of earth to cart, the engineers face major landslides. There is much at stake which necessitates employing thousands of workers. There are moments when a workforce will be demanded. As there had been great Napoleonic victories, there's a prisoner workforce, notably Prussians. So he will give five or six hundred Prussian prisoners to complete the works. So it's a colossal job because thousands of people will clear the land in order to make the embankments and the digging and the backfill for the Canal de Lourc. In the background of this huge project, Pierre-Simon Girard and his team of engineers and workers are carrying out work of great precision. They need to keep the trench at a constant slope of an average of three and a half inches per 0.6 miles over a length of 67 miles. An exploit they achieve with the aid of the master tool of topographical science, the level. With the help of a graduated leveling rod placed on point A, the engineer who is on point B can, in this way, evaluate the difference in height between the two points. Normally, when there is a slope, point B should be lower than point A. So advancing in this way all along the canal, we can define precisely the leveling of the canal, which after the works will allow us to know, in relation to the natural ground we find ourselves on, what digging needs to be done to have a constant slope. The Canal de Lourdes project benefits from the permanent attention of Napoleon. An artilleryman by training, Bonaparte is a man of science who understands the language of engineers, a man to whom no technical subtlety escapes. Napoleon enormously enjoyed visiting building sites. So what he liked to do was to arrive early in the morning at five or six o'clock and as was his habit, it was a rapid fire of questions, which needed very, very quick and brief answers, which he stored up. It's a political building site. He has his reputation at stake. He has a promise which he has given to the Parisians, that they will finally have quality water. For Napoleon, it's imperative that this project is completed as quickly as possible. The first water of the Canal de Lourdes arrives in the basin of La Villette in 1808. However, the network is still not finished. The Canal Saint-Martin, which must link the Canal de Lourdes with the Seine, is barely started, but its path is laid out. It will pass under the Place de la Bastille, where it will feed a giant fountain in the shape of an elephant, which will never be erected. It's there that in 1810, Napoleon will build a huge vault, one of the last projects of the emperor in the capital. The whole canal will be finished in 1825 and will establish itself as a major commercial and industrial infrastructure of Paris. The basin of La Villette will even at one time be the principal port in France and as a consequence will aid the development of its warehouses and factories which will develop progressively throughout the 19th century. The Canal de Lourdes, the Rue de Rivoli, Vendôme Column, the Madeleine Church, the Arc de Triomphe, Every one of these projects, achieved or still in construction, will be left to the capital for posterity by Emperor Napoleon. He died in Saint Helene in 1821, six years after his defeat at Waterloo. His ashes will eventually be repatriated by Louis Philippe. They rest in the Dome des Invalides, in the heart of this city that he dreamt of making imperial.